Otto al Jubair said to me, Joel, do you realize you're the first Christian leader in your group of evangelical leaders, the first Christian leaders in the 300 years that the Saud family has controlled so much of the Arabian Peninsula that have ever been invited inside the palace? And I said, no, I, I didn't know that. So he wanted to build a bridge uh, through me and my group to the broader 60 million American evangelicals to say, we're not the Saudi Arabia that you once thought of. I just got back from sunny and beautiful countries in the Gulf, uh, Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, where I've spent quite a bit of time, including with senior leaders in the past. And again, uh, just this past week, uh, we were talking about business investments or what's happening because of the Abraham Accords relationship between Israel and the Gulf, how that's changing everything. We also talked about uh, the challenges with Iran and the possibility of a war in this region with Iran. But the big topic that everybody there here in Israel is talking about is Netanyahu's vow to make peace with Saudi Arabia, to expand the Abraham Accords into Saudi Arabia. And that means making a deal and persuading the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, the very controversial but consequential Mohammed bin Salman. Is that possible? Now, to have a conversation about these fascinating topics, particularly who is MBS, I want to talk to Tal Heinrich. Tal, first of all, welcome to Jerusalem. You are the producer of the Rosenberg Report. You're a senior correspondent for all Israel News, all Arab News. You're an Israeli. You were born and raised here, but you're working for us out of New York. But you're home. You're here for a little bit. It's a pleasure welcome. to be here. I love Jerusalem. love being here, uh, sitting down with you today. Uh, Joel, I know that your passport has many stamps from various countries in the Gulf. One of them is Saudi Arabia and two as <laughs> actually, <laughs> right, two actually right. and as an Israeli and you're an Israeli I must ask you how come you went there not only to visit the kingdom but also to meet in person with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman you're not a diplomat you're not a politician and as far as I know you're not a billionaire oh that's true <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, maybe if we move further into private equity. But listen, uh, it is it is crazy. I had a senior official, a senior Israeli official, say when I got back, Joel, do you realize you're the first Israeli outside of senior intelligence officials, diplomats, who's ever publicly met? Actually, you're the only Israeli who's ever publicly met with MBS, where they release photos. Um, why do they do it? Uh, MBS is trying to change the entire brand of Saudi Arabia. It, it, it used to be called the Forbidden Kingdom. They didn't want anybody other than Muslims to come into the kingdom. Uh, they're the epicenter of Islam, Mecca, Medina, and the whole thing. But they didn't want outside business. They didn't want outside, they didn't want tourists. If you were a Jew or a Christian or anybody who was not a Muslim, you pretty much couldn't go unless, uh, under very rare circumstances. But MBS is trying to change everything. He has this vision 2030, right? He wants to change the economy from an oil-based economy to a, a, a modern 21st century high-tech uh, economy. To do it, he's trying to reach out to different sectors, to different groups. He's trying to reach out to Christians. The foreign minister of Saudi Arabia told me when we were in New York at the UN, just finalizing the details for the trip. Uh, this was probably September of 2018. Adel al Jubair said to me, Joel, do you realize you're the first Christian leader in your group of evangelical leaders, the first Christian leaders in the 300 years that the Saud family has controlled so much of the Arabian Peninsula that have ever been invited inside the palace? And I said, no, I, I didn't know that. So he wanted to build a bridge uh, through me and my group to the broader 60 million American evangelicals to say, we're not the Saudi Arabia that you once thought of. So I understand the Crown Prince's interest in meeting you as an evangelical leader, as a journalist, but for you, as far as I know, it wasn't such a simple decision to make because of the timing of your well, first visit there. Yeah, I, the decision was easy to make at the beginning because we got invited in the summer of 2018. And at that point, MBS was on sort of a, an American blitz, uh, an, an international blitz to say, come and invest in the kingdom, come visit the kingdom. We're open, opening our doors, we're rebranding, right? So that wasn't hard to say yes to. I led evangelical delegations to meet with King Abdullah of Jordan, to President el-Sisi in Egypt, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed in the United Arab Emirates and other places. And so I thought, wow, I mean, if a Saudi leader wants me to come not just as an evangelical, but knowing I'm an Israeli citizen, that I'm Jewish, my father's side, that's a big deal. But you're right. Um, on October 2nd, the news broke that Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi dissident journalist, was missing. And soon we learned that not only had he been murdered 
inside a Saudi consulate in Turkey, but that he'd been brutally dismembered, chopped up in, in pieces. Horrifying, disgusting, gruesome murder. And now the question was, should I go or not? And you decided to go. We decided to go because, first of all, we didn't know if MBS was guilty or not. Uh, you know, everything was happening very quickly. Secondly, if we decided not to go, we're essentially being judge and jury. We're saying, you know, it's, it's disrespectful. And knowing that no other Christian leaders had been invited inside the palace to meet with the future king of Saudi Arabia, who could reign for 50 years or more, who could be the one to open up churches for the first time in modern Saudi history, to say no to that might close the door for another 300 years. But it was a huge risk. And honestly, Atal, it was like going up a one-way street against traffic because everyone else, business people, politicians, they were all fleeing. We don't want to have anything to do with MBS. So President Biden refers to him as a murderer. Right. He referred to the kingdom as a pariah on the campaign trail. Right. And he vowed to reevaluate, reconsider the entire relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Uh, yet. Recently, last year, he sort of uh, backtracked his previous remarks by going there right, to see right. uh, the crown prince and uh, meet also with the king. Uh, my question to you, I mean, you sat down with him, you know, for a conversation in four eyes. And uh, did you see a murder when you look into his eyes or did you see something that's being overlooked rather by the West, something that we don't know about him? It's a good question, Tal, and I'm not entirely sure how to answer it. I you know, were we walking in that first time? Because again, I went uh, then led a second delegation at his request. But were we meeting with the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or someone who was being attacked and maligned, but it wasn't really his fault? I can tell you that the 10 of us evangelicals that were in the room did not walk away with that feeling, oh my gosh, I'm in the presence of evil. Mm -hmm. Now, is it possible that he knew? Is it possible that he ordered it? Yeah, both of those things are possible. As I say in my book, Enemies and Allies, that's possible and we can't rule that out. What Biden has done, I think, is in incredibly irresponsible. He has condemned MBS as a murderer, except there's no proof, or at least they haven't released any proof. Is there, if there's proof, I want to know, mm -hmm. right? But right now it's conjecture and everybody says, well, he had to know because that's the way the Saudi system is. You, you know, you can't be at that level and not know. Okay, but everybody said Saddam Hussein absolutely had chemical weapons, except that he didn't have them in the end. Everybody said, oh, uh, Donald Trump colluded with the Russians to win in 2016, except a $35 million investigation by a special counsel proved that wasn't true. So the conventional wisdom of circumstantial evidence isn't always right. I think the thing to understand about MBS is that he's he's young. I think he's made a number of mistakes, but I think he's the best thing that's ever happened to modern Saudi Arabia. He is he wants to take the country in a different place and sitting with him for two hours the first time, two hours the second time. Um, when was the second time? Uh, was the next year, September of 2019. We actually met with him on September 10th, the day before the anniversary of 15 out of 19 hijackers hijackers attacking America Did you tell him that were Saudis. about the timing about that did you ask him we anything? did we you know one of the questions we asked him was uh, help us understand what were you doing on 9/11 we all spent the morning at breakfast uh, as a team talking about what we were doing but here we are in Saudi Arabia bin Laden is Saudi 15 of the 19 hijackers Saudi what were you doing that morning what did he say it was fascinating I say this in my book enemies and allies but he said to us I was 16 years old. My father, who's now the king, but at the time he was the governor of Riyadh, the most important province in, in Saudi Arabia. My mom saw what was happening on television, called all, all of us kids to come and see. He said, I was so horrified and so angry at that moment. I realized that all, as all the speculation grew about that it's, it's a Saudi, Bin Laden, who orchestrated this attack, that as a Saudi, as an Arab, as a Muslim, I'll be ashamed for the rest of my life. I'll never be able to travel without people thinking of me as one of those horrible terrorists. And what he, what he said further was really shocking. He said, basically, my, my cousins, my brothers and I, we grew up thinking we're going to grow up, we're going to come to power, and we're going to kick the, I'll say it as <laughs> Christian television, kick the, the behind <laughs> of the people that did this. He basically made a commitment that he doesn't want to live in a country where people perceive him and his people as 
terrorists, as radical extremists. And he is, and, and now that he's in power, he's fundamentally transforming the country. Now, there's a long way to go. But I think it's important to, I think this is his motivation. He doesn't want to be ashamed of his country. He wants it to be a modern, open country.